Well, um, I can either start, you can ask questions, or I can start and please feel free to interrupt. I've never done this before. I'll tell you my experiences. They are not as factual, financial, deep as yours, but some of them are funny, and they are all true. Anyway, um, in the early 70s, I was a young actor. Why don't you come a little closer so we don't look like I have a big audience when I talk here. Uh, in the early 70s, late 60s, early 70s, I was a young actress working off Broadway at the Living Theater and any place else that would have me. And in terms of your expertise, I was making $37.32 a week and happy as a pig and shit to get that. <laughs> <laughs> and one day I was asked to be on a soap opera. And I said, what is a soap opera? <laughs> and they explained to me it was a 30 minute story. Everybody used to say, go and watch my stories. <laughs> and it was a 30 minute story. And I was called in to do a three day part for something like $150 a day for three days. <laughs> <laughs> and I was to be a, a neighbor to Susan Lucci. We all know who Susan Lucci is, whether we do independent films or big budget films, we know she was the 97 time nominee for Emmy and finally got it. And I was her friend, her little uh, neighbor, and I was very pregnant. I was supposed to be very pregnant. And they allowed me to do wonderful, outlandish, ridiculous, I mean, uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. and everybody was laughing, and it was a wonderful time. And I thought, gee, this soap stuff. Maybe you can have fun. Maybe it can be artistic. Certainly you can pay the rent. <laughs> so they asked me to do those three days. I did those three days. And then I got a call from the same casting lady, a lady named Joan Diancheco, who said, will you go up and read? And very often I would get on my hard horse and say, I don't read. You have to see my work. Don't do that. Read for anything you can read for. I'm talking to an actress. <laughs> so I went up to read for a character called Wanda Webb on One Life to Live. And it was supposed to be two or three days. It was supposed to bring the leading actor who had gone off to make movies, who called back to be on the soap, was supposed to bring him back in. And he was going to come into a diner. And he was going to talk to me. And then his ex-wife was going to come. They did the whole big stories that they have that they go on and on and on. And so I went, and I had a good time. I had a really good time. Where did you have to report to? I had to report to an apartment on 66th Street because we were such neophytes to ABC that they didn't have studio space for us. We rehearsed in an apartment on 66th Street, and then we all walked across, and I think the studio at the time was on 67th Street, and we kind of sneaked in, and you had to finish by about 2 o'clock because the important stuff was going on. And these soap things, they just, you know, we just put them on. So we had a wonderful time for a couple of years when we were a half hour. And they didn't take themselves too seriously. They were very good writers. There were a lot of actors that were theater actors, that were studio members, that were serious theater actors that would come in and do this half hour stuff, the bread and butter stuff, to pay the rent. And then it went to 45 minutes for a very short time. And they suddenly got very self-important. And they had to uh, check clear with this, and they had to check with the sensors and the things. And I used to make this, um, I used to always try to drive them crazy. And my character was a very funny character. Her name was Wanda Webb, and she uh, eventually married somebody named Rolex, so I used to be Wanda Webb Rolex, the wonderful widow waitress. <laughs> <laughs> and there were points where I would try to make them quite mad in the control room. And there was one point where, I had a line saying that I had inherited some money and I was going to buy a fur coat. And I said, oh, I have this money, I'm going to buy a fur coat. <laughs> wait, 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 stop tape, stop tape. What did Marilyn say? I said, I'm, I've inherited money and I'm going to buy a fur coat. That's what Marilyn said. Wanda said, I have money, I'm going to get a fur coat. And I made them crazy. Finally, they said, buy something else. Get a bracelet. Get a hat. Don't get a fuck coat. So they did not get a fuck coat, needless to say. I got a bracelet or something. 
all during this time I was doing plays off Broadway and on Broadway and we're at a film festival I've done a number of short films and I was involved with two films which I wish at the time I'd known how they were financed did anyone ever hear of a film called looking up it was a biggie uh, it was originally to have starred Dick Sean, may he rest in peace, yeah. and Phyllis Diller. Rest in peace. May she also rest in peace. And at one point, Phyllis Diller said, We'll have to learn all this! And they said, Well, yeah, that's what you do. So somebody said, We can't do this serious film with Phyllis Diller. Who do you know? Who, who do you know? So somebody said, I know Marilyn Chris. And so they came to Marilyn Chris. I didn't ask them to rewrite the script. I didn't ask them to write extra parts for me. I was pleased to have the leading role in a film. And it turned out to be quite good. It was done by a filmmaker named Linda Yellen. She did Playing for Time with Vanessa Redgrave, about which a lot of Jews were very upset because it took place in a concentration camp. Mm -hmm. And she believed that the uh, Palestinians were right and the Israelis are wrong. So there was a big brouhaha about that. But it was a, a, quite a good film. It got very good reviews and went right off the radar. It had big stars, me, Dick Sean, I don't know anybody else you know, Doris Bellack, Harry Gauze, New York theater actors, uh, had a premiere at the theater on 57th Street and was, was quite wonderful. And another film named, hmm, Honeymoon Killers. Honeymoon Anyone Killers? ever heard of Honeymoon Killers? I'll get you a copy of it. It, it is a wonderful film. It was made by um, William Buckley's producer, Warren Stiebel, may he rest in peace. All my stories are going to be may he rest in peace. So. Uh, and someone named Leonard Castle. And Martin Scorsese was supposed to have directed it. And I don't know what happened. He didn't. And I was doing a Broadway play at the time and wanted to play the lead in it. The lead in it was a lady named Martha. It was originally named Dear Martha, and it was the story of this Latin lover and this very, very, very heavy set nurse that meet through uh, the Lonely Hearts Club and become a couple, and she poses as his sister when he goes off and marries all these people and steals their money and kills them. Oh. And I helped to, I was one of the people that he was going to marry her. But I went up wanting to get the part of Martha. And I dressed in about five or six sweaters. And I put cotton on out. And I really wanted to play Martha. And I was talking to them about how I wanted to play Martha, the nurse. I think I was wearing all white or something. And it got very hot as we were starting to act. And again, I took off one sweater. I took off another sweater. I took off another. Finally, I said, uh, can I play Martha? And they said, no. But we love you, pick any part you want. So I played one of the victims, and I got to die <laughs> on a bus <laughs> with Tony Lobianco. I died with that. Tony Lobianco. And uh, Shirley Stoller eventually played the part. And she's a very heavy set actress. And used to make the circuit, excuse me, places like this, saying, I owe my career to Marilyn Chris. And she appeared in a number of Lena Bergmuller films. And I've done a number of short films. But the point is that soaps were really quite wonderful for a very long time until they became very self-important. And they started to make movies on a soap opera dime. And it got to be rather tedious. We would be there from 7 in the morning until 2, 3 o'clock in the morning doing party scenes and shit. And after it doesn't give you that much money for overtime. And it stopped being fun. And when it stopped being fun in 93, I'd been talking about it for a long time, my husband said, quit. Quit. <laughs> and I have some place to go, and I have an identity, and I don't have to take guff from anybody. But he talked me into quitting. And I went, I said, don't, don't, no, my, my contract is coming up. I, don't, don't tell me how much more money you'll give me. Don't tell me how many more weeks of vacation. I have to go. And they offered more money and more weeks of vacation, but it wasn't fun. And I was no longer working two or three days a week. I had become the, 
kind of background stuff. It was all about young people. They were all very young. They all had little tiny nodes and cute little tits, and it had nothing to do with acting anymore. And so I quit, and now I've been uh, roaming the streets like most other actors. Looking <laughs> 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 for work, doing little movies here and there. But they show up the characters. No, 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 no. No, they had me run off. Um, I ran off with Tom, who I had just met, and we were reading poetry on a bench on Valentine's Day, and the next thing you knew, he wanted to go to Seattle and open a bookstore. What Wanda Wolf Warlock knew about a bookstore, but I went off with Tom, and they kept, they would call, you know, on this other thing. Oh, hi, it's Wanda. Yeah. yeah. No, no, she just called to say she's fine. How's the baby? Yeah, the baby's fine. What? She's not coming for Thanksgiving. She's not coming for Christmas. She's not coming for New Year's. After about a year, they tried to replace me with somebody else, who was a very nice actress, but she didn't get Wanda. There was a certain thing to Wanda that they had allowed me to do when I was allowed to do the work. And it was, um, it, wasn't, it, just, it just wasn't fun. So since then, I have done a number of shorts. Maybe someday you'll show the shorts here. Mm -hmm. I've done something called Lucky by a um, filmmaker named Melissa Berman, who was a very talented lady and kind of scared, so she's not going any further. And I did something called Comfortable Distance by a filmmaker that a few people don't know him, you should. His name is James Bang, and he is a Korean fellow that I did one film with him, and I've seen three other films of his and each one is a separate entity. He's a wonderful, wonderful filmmaker. Write it down, J-A-M-E-S-B-A-N-G. <laughs> call him Jimmy Bang Bang. Jimmy and Bang look Bang. at his film. <laughs> Anne will get his film to you, and it's, uh, he's a wonderful filmmaker. And um, I've not worked a lot in the last little while because my husband is not well, so I started a short film festival at North Shore Towers, which I couldn't have done. You know North Shore Towers, are okay. You, are you at North Shore Towers? Yes, I mean, I'm still keeping my apartment in Manhattan, but I am there. I am a little young for there. They all assume I'm an aide, you know, and everybody says, oh, how is your gentleman? I say, my gentleman is fine. How is your lady? Your lady is fine. They think I'm an aide because I push him in the wheelchair. And uh, that's okay with me. But anyway, I was there two months and said, I've got to do something. And uh, I said, let's start a short film festival. So we started a short film festival. And uh, it's been quite successful. We're going into the third year. So if any, you're all just very kind people that stay to not make me feel foolish. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, if any of you know short films that you would like to submit to us, there is no submission fee, there is no admission fee. Uh, I get a great many films now from Anne because she is beyond generous <laughs> and kind. And uh, we are now starting to attract filmmakers because we gave out an award. Give an award, you make a thing, you know, you make a ballot and you sign a ballot, we count the ballots oh, and you are serious about the ballots. Oh, very, very serious. Yeah, yeah. I'm not very, sure not, but they think. No, 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 they're very, very serious about the ballots. And when I first started with a committee with were morons, they're not a committee anymore. <laughs> they said, oh, we should, uh, we should make categories for uh, lighting and design and costume. I said, what do you know about lighting, design, and costume? <laughs> you know the film is good or bad, you enjoyed it or not, what did you enjoy about it, which one was the best of the five, and that, so we give an audience appreciation award, and uh, they take it seriously, but it is now beginning to appear on people's resumes and on people's websites, so I'm starting to get, you know, what, what is the deadline for your film? What, how do I give submissions? What do I do? And it's, it's a lot of fun and, and quite successful, and almost enough of a creative outlet. What's the name of the? Short Film Festival at North Shore Towers. Very, uh, <laughs> very imaginative, very, uh, <laughs> like, Henry and I run the theater there. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know it's that. It's a theater. <laughs> yeah. What yeah. did you say? Henry and I run the theater there. Right. 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 It's a lovely theater. And it's and a lovely theater. So. Yeah. It's a lovely theater. And you've been beyond kind. No. You've been fun. Well. No. I'm been fun. I'm always fun. <laughs> fun. I was a fun girl. <laughs> <laughs> you've been really beyond kind. You and Henry. Even the instructions you gave me to get here. Oh, it's very good stuff. I've got very good stuff. We started out that I had done a number of short films, two of which are very good. So we put those in. We didn't put in the ones that weren't good. And then we've attracted people that we know, and we've dealt with the Columbia University 
they have their uh, uh, film festival at the end of every given year, and they've sent me their stuff. But I'm starting to do less and less with Columbia and NYU, and uh, people from AFI have said, mm -hmm. oh, could we submit things? But getting them from you, and you'll see this next one coming up, September 29th. And uh, that's soaps. What other questions do you have about soaps? Did anybody even know they existed? But well, we put it on here. Oh, no. no. You have a question? Uh, we'll have to live, absolutely. Well, one life to live was a biggie, it's and still, I was a biggie. No, 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 no. no. I mean, it's still like in, in people's forefront oh, of their minds. I get a lot of free drinks yeah. still. <laughs> <laughs> I put in money to me, and I still get a lot of free drinks. Yes. <laughs> and yes. you still recognize them. I mean, very very much so. Very yeah, much yeah, so. Yeah, and yeah. some of them are blind and lovely and say, you look the same. I <laughs> 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 love you. You are so dumb. <laughs> oh, blind and lovely. <laughs> Do you have any regrets uh, that things that you could have done better or anything like that? Or you're pretty much oh, happy yeah. with the outcome. Well, I should have left long before, but when I started on the soap, as I said, I made $37.32 a week, and I had a boy, a uh, son, that I was raising by myself, and uh, he needed braces and Tai Chi and uh, sure. Hebrew lessons and... Uh, I don't know what kids need, and it's very difficult to give them that on 37 32 a week, even though my rent was $73 a month in the village, wow. and I walked everywhere. So yeah. I didn't have any car fare, and I got great legs. But, it, uh, <laughs> you know, I had to do it. And then you get kind of used to it, and you kind of tell yourself that you're doing good work, and the check gets bigger, and you get invited to, you know, the, the soap parties, and you sign autographs, and you think you're hot stuff. You know, and I saw a lot of the kids come on and say, oh, well, who writes this shit? I said, wait, 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 Don. If you're taking the check, it can't be shit. Mm. You also have to know that the live mic's here, and there are people upstairs that write this stuff. And you might hurt somebody's feelings. And if it's shit, a lot of people waiting to do it, mm. a lot of people waiting to take the check, and don't do anybody any favors. Stay here, make it as good as you can. When you can't make it good, then go away. You know, they don't need you. And no, regrets, probably I stayed too long and I got too far off the, the live theater circuit, the, you know, the Broadway and the off-Broadway. I still have my hand in and I'm doing readings and I'm working on a one-person play that maybe we'll read, maybe we'll read here if you like it, or maybe we'll read it in the, at the theater. I don't know that it's, you know, I keep censoring will it be for them or not. But it's a, it's a one-person play that's very interesting. It's about a serial killer. <laughs> and it's funny. <laughs> and it's sad. And it's really quite well written. You'll meet the lady. She's coming to the uh, September 29th um, festival because a friend of hers did a film that is that will be shown oh. called It Happened in Havana, A Yiddish Love Story. <laughs> it, Havana. Havana. Okay. it Happened in Havana, <laughs> A Yiddish Love Story. And um, Are you still friends with a lot of people from the show? No. No. no, we all of us were very, very, very different people, and there were uh, most of the people there that were theater people peeled off early on, and the rest became soap people, and it became that that was so wonderful, and we're doing such wonderful work, and I don't work that way. I try to do the best I can, whether it's Broadway, off Broadway, a day on Law and Order, whatever it is, and then get on with it, and. Come in, please. We're lonely. <laughs> <laughs> but you no. Know, Come on in. It's okay. Real regrets? Are, no, no. I don't. I don't. I try not to regret anything in in life. I can't do that. I wouldn't. I can't exist that way. Mm -hmm. But it was a fun ride for a very long time, and it and it uh, it afforded me a lot of things uh, that are important to life. Mm -hmm. And uh, no regrets. I just stayed a little too long at the fair. But you do that. You when did that. you meet your husband? I and mean, you could tell them who your husband is. Oh, my husband is an actor named Lee Wallace. Oh, the name will not go, but he was the mayor in the first Batman with Jack Nicholson. He was in a movie called Used People. He was Shirley MacLaine's brother, which is really odd. He, he's done a lot of movies. He's done a lot of Broadway plays. And I had never done a musical. And he had done musicals. He's a good singer. He's a good dancer. And we were both involved. We both got cast in a movie called Laugh a Little, in a play, in a, a Broadway tryout called Laugh a Little, Cry a Little, which we refer to as Laugh, Cry, Fart. 
not a good not a good musical. And he used to when we first met, I tell these stories so often, we first met for the first read through around the table. I was a big smoker at the time and he came in and he had a cigar. And he knew me and didn't like me. And I knew him, I, I thought he was a wonderful actor, and I was smoking my little cigarette, and he came in with a cigar. I said, are you gonna smoke that thing? And he said, not near you, honey. <laughs> and he walked away, and I thought, it's gonna be very difficult to play husband and wife with this one. You don't like me, it's not near you, honey. And then as we began to work, we realized we had a wonderful chemistry and respect for each other as workers, and then it became something else. And that's, that's what it is now. You have questions as an actor? No. <laughs> <laughs> you have no questions to be answered? No? Can't be shy. Can't be shy. I am. You can be. Yeah. You can. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Would you, you, so you do it all over again. So you have no regret. You do it all over again, just less. Yeah. I mean, yeah. That's good. I, mean I, I would do more things, not stay at the soap that long. Yeah. Because I think I missed out. You know, because I was supposed to go to the Actors Theatre of Louisville, and they said, oh, no, you can't come. You have a big storyline coming up. And in the seven weeks I would have been away, I would have been on three times. I could have flown back from that. Mm -hmm. You know, so I, that's not a regret, but I should have known better. Uh, I just stayed too long at the fair, and I stayed beyond when it was really fun. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you can afford to, financially, physically, emotionally, you shouldn't stay where it ain't fun. Yeah. You know, I mean, it can't all be fun, but it's got to be good times. It can't be when the paycheck, am I getting overtime? What's the way? It's, it's got to be something more than that. And it stopped being more than that. Because we used to love it. We used to have a good time. We used to talk about the characters. We used to go out afterward. We used to eat. We used to drink. We used to drink. We used to drink. We used to go out and talk, you know. <laughs> and it was about <laughs> it, right? <laughs> and now it, uh, now they come in and they do their little segment and they have in their contract that they get out early. And it, it's different. It's just it, new things change. It's different. So that wasn't SAG actually. That was after. After it was after. Now it's the same thing. Yeah, they merged. They merged, yeah. but it was after at the time. And it used to be you came in eight o'clock in the morning. You rehearsed your stuff. It was a half hour. You were out by two. And if you had to do a matinee, I said, "Oh, you do your stuff first. I'll go later." And you go and you, we could do a matinee, and you didn't have to worry about getting out for a curtain. But when it became an hour, it became another kind of uh, uh, mm -hmm. devotion to it that. Um, I should have made for so long, but I did, and here I am, and it's, you know, it's what it is. So, you have any questions? You'll sit and watch all of this stuff, and listen to all of this stuff. No questions, huh? Well, it must have been very interesting. You can't have questions, because I, I don't know. I have questions. Okay. Um, what was your interaction with the writers? In the beginning, it was wonderful. We were, we talked with them. Very often you would have this conversation that you know you were having, and the next day half of it would appear in the script, you know, and it would be changed, what it would be about an incident or about something you talked about. And we were friends. As it got to be self-important, um, we were adversaries. And uh, I don't think you can do that kind of thing every day. I don't think you should, but I don't think you can do that kind of thing and have an adversarial relationship. I think it has to be that I respect what you do and I like what you do and you respect and like what I do and we try to make it as good as we can because it's not what I act or what you write or how you direct it because we all can't do it without the other one. And so there has to be a mutuality which maybe not for everybody but I found was not you know, I, I come in, I work all the time when I come in. I come in at 7 o'clock and I'm going to, I'm there to work. I'm not there to go to gym. I'm not there to, obviously. I'm not there to, to I'm just there to do the work. And uh, my nickname used to be, you want to run. And I was, oh, you want to run. Let's, we run Let's ask them if we can change this word. Let's see if we can get up on this line. What, what, something would it be funnier, what, what, what? And, and that ceased to be. They would come in, they kind of do it. They had sort of photographic memories. And then they had to go to the gym, or they had to go to an appointment, or they, and it was not doing the work anymore. You know, and uh, the writers were an important part of it. I mean, how long can you, you know, do an improvisation on television that has to cut for a commercial, and the four guys have to know when to follow you around. You know, you can't do that. So, so it was a good one when it was good. You didn't raise your hand, you just were going to scratch your head and mm -hmm. yeah. embarrass you. <laughs> okay. Well, 
I, I am curious, have you been paying attention to the changes that have happened? In yes, the there's no, no changes, they're all off the air. Well, Most of the ships are off the air. Aren't they online maybe? No, they, they had uh, endeavored to do all my children and one life to live on Hulu. Mm. Uh -huh. And uh, it didn't work out. Oh, really? It didn't oh, work out. Geez. So they're off, I think they're up only two or three left out of California. I don't think there are any left in New York anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's unfortunate because it was a great source of income to the actors. Yeah. You know, people would come into a day or two, be a judge, but now you do it on law and order. You do it on the nighttime mm -hmm. stuff and you make more money and it lasts for longer because you get the reruns and it gets rerun <coughs> and uh, so it makes more sense. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there are very few soaps left. There's really no need for them anymore. You know, you have reality TV, you have the Law and Orders, all of them that are left that are, you know, still filming. And it's the same stories, you know, except you don't attenuate them. You know, I mean, I would come and say, I'm going to wear the same dress because I'm playing the same scene, but from line four to line six. And then Wednesday, I'll do it from line six to line seven. Then on Friday, we'll recap it. This one dress for all week because we're doing the same scene because you might have missed it. So, you know, it got, it got to be a little difficult. It got to be difficult. Was any of it live when you started? When we started, it was yeah, live, yes. Yeah. And they had cue cards. Mm -hmm. And I can't use cue cards. I either have to know what I'm talking about or I can't do it. I can't be, to, 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 to be and then if the guy moves, I'm like up the, uh, the creek. But there used to be, people used to put their lines on the bottom of a sofa. They used to put them on the bottom of a glass table. One guy used to put them on a cigarette and then they would just burn away, but I, I couldn't. And there was one time I was in a scene with somebody and she was doing things like this and they kept cutting, thinking she was looking at the cue cards and she couldn't. And then about the middle of the term, you know, while we were there, uh, an actor named Phil Carey, who you may or may not know, was on, he was the, the, the leading guy on it and he couldn't remember lines. He was an older fellow and was used to doing a seventh of a page of a movie. He wasn't used to doing 15 pages of a soap. And he would come in and he would literally do the thing like this too. Eventually they took the cue cards away because they found that people didn't know how to use them. And a lot of people got very scared and couldn't do it. You know, they just, just couldn't do it. Because it's rough to learn. If you have a lot of stuff, it's rough. And then you start to paraphrase and then you start to just learn the, the lead in and the lead out so you don't screw the cameraman up and you kind of do the best you can do in the middle if you have a lot to do. And that's not good for young people to learn how to do that. It's not, it's not a good idea. Wow, wow, yes. Mm -hmm. So what would be your advice on how to memorize a lot of lines when you have them, if you're not used to having a lot of lines? You never get used to it and you have to just chip away at it there are no shortcuts. You can try to make connections with words and connect words to actions and connect actions to what you're going to do. But then it starts to get a little robotic and you look like you're in an airport, you know, when you're doing that. You just got to just put them into your head and keep them there and repeat them and repeat them and repeat them and make them yours. So would you suggest recording them to yeah, them over that's and over good. again? Yes, recording them over and over again, writing them out helps. You know, you write it and you see it. When you see it written down, you take it off the page, try to put it in your brain, write it down, look at it, put it down. Anything that you can do by rote, because there are no secrets. Recordings, writing it, uh, somebody helping you constantly, and it takes a great deal of effort to do it, even with a photographic line, even with, but it just, it's just work. That's the crap work you just have to do to get to the fun part because there is a fun part at the yes. end. Acting is a wonderful fun part. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, but no, no secrets. I have no secrets. I have no secrets. Did, um, you said you had started out with live theater. Sure. That, did you, were you part of a specific uh, yeah. school of acting? Well, I'm Stanislavski School of Acting, Performing Arts High School, and then Jean Frankel. Then I was a member of the Living a number of years, and I was a member of the Chelsea Theatre Center for a number of years. And, uh, which was the first time I really got, we got involved with multimedia in that you know, we did Allen Ginsberg's poem of Kaddish and it was done uh, with triptyches uh, during the live action and then they carted me off to the funny farm and I actually went out and then you saw me in the back of the ambulance
trying to get out, and then you saw the people taking me out of the house and putting me into it. It was a fascinating thing to do, really quite a fascinating thing to do. But yes, so, uh, many off-Broadway plays, and the first thing was Living Theater and then the Chelsea Theatre Center. And uh, that's where I live, uh, but I haven't been able to do very much of it in the last little while. So I was, I was wondering, what was the best direction you ever had, you know, on stage or on screen or just... Best direction? Yeah. Anything anybody ever tell you to help you with your performance? Anything that stood out? Do less. I'm sorry? Do less. Do less. Because I'm very volatile, and on the Broadway stage, that's fine. But with the camera up your nose, when I start to do things, you're fine. You're far away. But uh, do less, generally, has been the best thing that has ever been told to me. And it goes across the board for all acting. Okay. It goes across for all medium. Uh, media, medium, mediums? Mm -hmm. All phases of uh, theatrical works. Okay. Yes, sir? Did you like doing live, or did it take it's very hard because when you're with the right people, with the right script and the right character, mm -hmm. it's all good. And I think of myself as a theater actor, but what few times I was in stuff that was awful, it stunk. If it stinks, it stinks. And if it's something good, Phil, you have to do a little less television, you have to do even less than that. But if you're, if you're cooking, they're all wonderful. And really all I mean if you like what you're doing and you, you you start to get it and you start cooking there there's no one better than the other there's no one better than the other so so what's been going on with the uh, New York theater oh I'm so glad you asked that because usually people say what's going on with Wanda is she gonna get married is she gonna do this what is going on with New York theater you mean with Patty Lapone and people in the, in the audience <laughs> That's well, live theater. I mean, I, th I think that, uh, or, see, I do a lot of stuff at uh, La Mama Theater. Sure. I read a play of mine, and, uh, but um, I, I seem to get the sense that in the, in the 70s, in the Lower East Side, there was a lot of energy, a well, lot of innovative wonderful. stuff. It was the Living yeah. Theater, there was the La Mama, there was the Circle in the Square. Everything is now blown up. It's something different. And it's not just that you start doing short films and that you graduate and you nurture something. It's, we're going to do a play to move it. Nobody does a play to do the play, to work on the play, to do the work. It's, we'll do it at La Mama and then let's move it to off-Broadway. And then let's get a hand of God and move it to Broadway. And so I, I don't know when you do the work, you know, if it's all to go to the next step. It's let's move it as opposed to work on it a little bit. That's what I think is happening with the New York theater. And I think a great deal of theater is happening outside of New York. Even that's starting to get a little tricky, that everybody wants to bring it in and make a buck. I mean, they're entitled to do that. That's why I went on a soap, was to make a buck. But something about the process is being lost. It may just be age on my part, that that's how I see it. But something is being lost in the New York theater. So, uh, so you feel that the short film, uh, the short film format, where filmmakers or creative people get to that's get to do your more. stuff. I think that's where you get to do your stuff. I, I don't know. Maybe Anne can show you the two little films that I'm very proud of. Are two short films that we did. We went down to Florida to do one. I think we did it in four days, uh, and it's charming, charming little film. And uh, the other film that I did, James Bang, that I did yeah, with James Bang, good. is a beautiful film. I don't know how he knows these things. He's a young man, and it's about uh, uh, a couple, uh, an older man who is infirm, I mean, almost a vegetable, and the, the wife that is taking care of him. And she wants to not have an affair, but to go out, to have lunch with another man, to. And it's such, and it, it was very resonant at North Shore Towers, because North Shore Towers, a lot of old people, and there's a lot of men in wheelchairs, and I got a lot of, how could you do that? I didn't do that, and I don't know that I agree with that, but this is what the filmmakers saw happening, and that I chose to try to present with him, interpret for him, and it's a lovely film. Uh, he talks every once in a while about trying to, you know, uh, 
make it into a bigger film and he went to Korea to try to get some money and uh, it just it's not working out and it's too bad because I'm afraid he'll leave you know filmmaking if it doesn't if something doesn't happen soon and he's not aggressive he's not an asshole he's a, an artist and I just hope he doesn't I, I just like hope he's this guy he's lovely he's a lovely man just really lovely man I don't know what's going to be with him I just saw him he came we did two years of the short film festival and um, at, at the end of the second one we did a retrospective of the four recipients of the audience appreciation award and his was one of them and I saw him then and uh, he came back from Korea and he didn't really get enough money and he was writing scripts you know so many of the young filmmakers I know not that young but so many young filmmakers they're writing scripts and then what do you do with them I mean they can come and listen to you they can come and listen to Mark but then most of the time they're not that kind of aggressive that they can go in and do a presentation and you know it, it, it's, a, it's a difficult thing to do and uh, I just hope he doesn't get left by the wayside okay 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 <laughs> <laughs>